we've uh, called the meeting to order and we're on the public hearing for zoning. Um, Josh was about to give us an overview. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think- Recording in progress. Sorry, Josh, wanted to make sure we got you for posterity. Yeah, yeah, yeah thanks. Um, trying to get in here. Just, um, I, think, I think all of you have seen the proposed changes. And as I explained last month, um, the changes um, that the Planning Commission took um, were to prepare for uh, an application um, to submit to the state eventually for the neighborhood designation program. Um, which um, allows for uh, benefits for development in designated downtown areas and the neighborhood de uh, designated area. Um, and so the changes um, were to help meet some of the requirements um, that we need to score um, in that application process. Initially, we didn't have uh, enough points um, and so the changes in the creation of section 314 um, and the change to section 506 um, gets us to we, what we think are enough points scored in an application. The first section uh, of the change to the language section 107, um, that is not in relation to the neighborhood designation program. That's just a change just to clarify how um, we're sort of defining land, de land development and development. Great. Um, I can go look for some supplemental speakers. Can you give them a half supply around? You have something? Yeah. We might be able to boost that here in a second. Do we have any questions or comments from board members on the proposed changes? Not for me. No? No? no. Any, any from the public? Jenny, you want to speak? Okay. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just be super quick. Jenny Carter, um, for the record, uh, with the Vermont Law Schools Institute for Energy and the Environment. And I'm just here to record our support for these amendments. Um, not only for the reasons that Josh spoke of in terms of helping the town uh, achieve an NDA designation, but also we think that some of the, the amendments on their own are also a good idea for the town in terms of creating, a, you know, sort of a more vibrant community where people are going to want to, you know, kind of work live and play so um, we are in support of these amendments um so if uh you can help us josh i this is just public hearing uh so next we'll close the public hearing but um i don't see where we're voting on it tonight. There are more, co there's no comment period after the public hearing, is there? No, no. Uh, typically, you, you would vote on it in the regular select board meeting. Okay. We'll make that a, okay. I'll deal with that when we get to the agenda. So, no more comments. We will close the public hearing and call the Board of Liquor Control to order. And first up is public comment on anything not on the agenda for the Liquor Control Board. Seeing none, we will look to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, 
Travis and Patty are here if you do have any questions for them right in the, in the front row. <laughs> May I ask a question? Sure. I don't know if it's past that point, um, but um, is it possible for you to reopen the agenda so that you take up the zoning amendments tonight rather yeah, we, than waiting we, for your we next will select at the start board? of the regular select board meeting? Pardon? <clears throat> we'll do that at the start of the regular Oh, I am so sorry. Is this liquor control? Yeah, yeah. we're yeah. liquor control. You're liquor control. I didn't think okay. we had liquor control. Well, we just having a hard time hearing. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to fix that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Could I make a motion, Jenny? Move we approve the first class liquor license application with outside consumption permit for Kaya's sandwiches and kitchen. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Seeing, motion carries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we were trying to get some external speakers going. I don't think that worked. Um, so does anybody want to adjourn the Board of Liquor Control meeting? Uh, move that we adjourn the Board of Liquor Control. Second, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Now we'll call the regular select board meeting to order. First up is public comment. This is for anything that's not on the agenda. Hey, Trini. Robin? Yep. <laughs> Am I the only one here? Um, I, I have some public comment that is kind of related to a Facebook conversation that I had prior to the parade. Um, and I'm here because I have ethical issues with calling out folks like the select board and the town manager on social media and then not coming to tell you why I was upset. Um, the the rerouting of the parade was a decision that I think made a great deal of sense. Um, I think it would have made a great deal more sense to reroute it and be public about it a lot earlier. I think that the the uh, Beanville Road project, the Beanville Road Pleasant Street project, we have known from the very beginning that that was a May to August project and that it was inevitable, I think that it was going to have some impact on the route of the parade. Um, and so I'm not sure whose decision it was not to talk about that sooner and not to talk about with the chamber about it sooner. But I think it was probably it, I certainly think it was the wrong one. Um, I would, and it ties back for me to a lot of other issues related to the board's communication about the conditions of our street. And I would go back to 2019 when there was a fairly robust conversation about the Maple Street renewal project, which was similar to the project that happened on Prospect Street, where the there were curbs installed and the the underpinning, the you know, the infrastructure was um, plumbing infrastructure was replaced, and people were given an opportunity to get their house to the road stuff replaced when everything was all being dug up anyway. And there was a lot of communication in the planning phase about that. And then May 2019 hit, and crickets. And I would say that the, I went back looking through the select board minutes, including those of um, May, bah bah, um, May 9th, when Adolfo, as town manager, made a report to the select board about the Maple Street project. And there was some conversation, and that's really all the minutes say. And so those of us who live on Maple Street with the gigantic potholes and with the sidewalk that is probably older than Jack Cowdery and paid because it was there when he was a kid. And, you know, the, the hundred year plus plumbing who thought we had a stake in the changes that were happening, all of a sudden lost that stake and lost that communication 
without any notice from the town. And so I rooted back in the minutes and I contacted Du Bois and King who ran the engineering stuff. And the, the best answer I got was, you know, it's a really expensive project and we don't have any money. And then there was nothing. So the, for me, the parade, I get that the parade had to be moved, but for me, moving the parade at a meeting that happened the week before the parade was scheduled to happen relative to a project that had been going on since May and probably in planning well before that feels extremely disrespectful. And I, I guess, you know, if I wanted to be snotty about it, my question would be, you know, what is it about the rest of Hospital Hill that makes their property tax dollars worth more than mine? Um, but, and that I live at the gateway from the hospital anyway, the gateway to Hospital Hill, which is one of Randolph's loveliest neighborhoods. And at this point in time, it is a neighborhood that has construction vehicles traveling down it on a pretty regular basis. And despite whatever that 2019 traffic study tells you, has always had two or three 18 wheelers heading down it a day, um, including the ones that scoot down there at two o'clock in the morning. Um, and is completely unusable by the elderly folk who live on our street. Jocelyn House is on our street. Um, the people who live there who would like to walk around the neighborhood are unable to do that without walking in the middle of the street. Um, the the um, daycare at Gifford, which used to regularly have the, the children walk around the, the hill, can't do that anymore because it's not safe. Um, it, there's just a whole bunch of things. And I get that you can't give us, you know, specifics about which holes are going to be filled when. I, I understand that. But the total lack of communication is very troubling. You know, it, it comes on top of the fact that I have two wheelbarrows full of road waste that I remove and take down to the dump every spring. And I have that because we don't have curbs, like Highland Avenue has curbs, and we don't have real sidewalks like Prospect Street and Highland Avenue have sidewalks. And we just, and we have no conversations, um, unlike what we had when people were first, when the select board was first talking about renovating Maple Street. So I am happy. Um, I, I am, am yes, ma'am. So um, totally get what you're saying, um, but a public comment is supposed to be a two minute introduction to a topic that you might like us to take up in a future agenda. Then I'll, I'll stop. You're looking for is um, for us to get together a status on this project. Um, I know it went kind of dormant for a while. It's still um, dormant, Trini. It's um, not a while. It's two years. Um, so, I, but I think what we've got to do is um, is go back and see. It did get pulled to a halt, um, and there was some neighborhood meetings that started uh, pre-COVID. So right. there were a lot of the, the neighborhood together during that, but uh, and there was supposed to be some coordination between the two so they could understand kind of um, what it might mean if it went to a one-way street, which yeah. direction it might go. There's a lot of disagreement by folks on there. So um, I think it's fair to ask us to have on the agenda next month a status of this project and um, potential some level of what's it going to take you know what does it look like and, and what is what is doable what isn't what are the next steps and what does that look like and and i thank you for that and i would 
say just as a, a moment for the board that the one way, two way thing was less important to the residents of Maple Street than it was to the residents of Highland Avenue, who I understand complain vociferously. Um, but again, you know, I don't think their tax dollars are worth more than mine. And most of the folks who live on my side of the street were perfectly happy to have the sidewalk relocated there. You know, if you go back through those plans as a board, I think you will see that the folks who live here now are the same folks, many of them are the same folks who lived there then. And I suspect that we will all say the same things. But we would like you to take it up and put it on the agenda and communicate with us about what the board's pleasure is about this. And that that communication would ease a lot of the agenda that that last minute decision about the parade created. Thank you. We have any other public comment? I will thank you for giving me some voice because I know I exceeded my two minutes and I appreciate it. I, you all know that I'm a collaborator rather than a confronter, but as I said, losing my temper on social media is not, and then not following up is, doesn't feel ethical to me. So. I appreciate it. I didn't see it. Yeah, <laughs> somebody did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. I have a agenda, and one thing we need to add on here is uh, taking up the land use regulation amendments. There's, Thank you. There's also a request. The library's got a grant opportunity that they found out about after we posted everything, but that would be due on the 8th of August if you'd be willing to add that as well, authorization to apply for that. It's an $8,700 grant uh, that would draw down some of the ARPA funds available through the Department of Libraries. I'll move that we put both the uh, land use um, issue and the library grant issue on, uh, on to the agenda. Second. We just I'm assuming that a motion to approve the agenda with those added. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, let me rephrase, rephrase it that way. A motion to approve the agenda with those two additions. Great. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Stage. Motion carries. Send calendar with uh, meeting minutes and groups this month. I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar. Second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Consider a uh, selection of a firm to do a reappraisal. It's been your packets. You've got a letter from the listers who are here tonight to present their recommendation in their process. I don't know if you want to move up front with us or what you guys normally do. This is my first live meeting with you, so I don't, I don't know if it's your normal flow. Um, so wherever works, and then um, in your packets, you've got their letter plus the RFPs that we received. Mm -hmm. Would you like us to give a general overview or just I think that makes sense. Sure. sure. So, and at some point, we would like to understand is what what is driving the need to do the reappraisal. Sure. Especially, we just got the new numbers, and they're pretty close to spot on. They are. So I, I'll start with uh, explaining kind of the process and why we think we need it now. Uh, Mimi's here also, so she can chime in anytime. Um, the last uh, reappraisal <laughs> that we had in Randolph was in 2006. So we're working with a base set of appraisals that are 15 years old, will soon be 16 years old. And although our CLA, our common level appraisal, is at 100.95% this year, um, there's a lot of factors to that. So what happens each year is the state um, 
does a sales study. They look at every sale in town and they want us to say whether they're valid or they're not valid. Um, there's things like transfer to children that obviously aren't valid. One of the things we come across is they ask if there's been any significant changes to the property um, since it was we last appraised it. And we can say <coughs> yes, there were substantial changes and that's why a sale might have been 20 or 30 percent higher. Um, what we don't say in that factor is that we haven't looked at it for 15 years. So, um, and we know that looking from the multiple listing service and tracking sales in town and seeing photos online of things that are for sale, that there's been lots of improvements to properties in town over the last 15 or 16 years that didn't necessarily require permits, interior things, renovation of kitchens and bathrooms or, you know, additional finished living space. For whatever reason, there's a lot of things that have been improved in people's properties that we just have lost track of because we don't go into the houses every year. So that prompted our desire to have a reappraisal. We also know that typically we would budget for a reappraisal for about a 10 year period, put away money so that we would have it when it was ready. We have the funds to do an appraisal, uh, to, to do the reappraisal. And so we put out an RFP, um, knowing that firms are fairly busy. There's not a ton of firms that do the work. Um, but we sent out an RFP the first part of March with a late April deadline. We had one person bid, uh, or send a proposal. That was for a 2023 town library appraisal, which we knew was a little bit ambitious because um, it takes a couple of years to do this kind of stuff. We got one proposal. Um, we reviewed it, felt like we really needed other proposals to compare. So we went back out to, uh, with another RFP for another month. Um, we had three people end up sending in proposals, two new firms plus the original one that wanted to keep theirs. For 2024. For 2024. Um, and the original so one was for 2024 as well. The original we did for, yeah. Oh, we advertised as 2023, but the one person that bid it bid for 2024. So we went back out for 2024 and we ended up with three proposals. So we um, read the proposals thoroughly. We um, looked at the, the costs for each. We, um, intervie we interviewed all three firms. We followed up with uh, checking all the references and we came to the determination that we thought the best for, for us was New England Municipal Consultants. Um, their firm out of the Northeast Kingdom, Lindenville, I believe. Uh, father and son owned and operated, um, thorough, knowledgeable. Um, we think they'll deliver us a great product. Um, the cost was the mid cost. It was probably $5,300 over the lowest cost. Um, but we felt the most comfortable with them. And if anybody saw today's Herald, there's a front page article that this same firm was just hired to actually run the assessor's office in Barnard. Um, so it's, uh, you know, they're, they're certainly doing work in this area. And we'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, Dennis, this, I'm not sure if this is exactly relevant to the selection of the company, but when, how is it possible that the common level of appraisal is so close even though it's been 15 years since we've done that huh? it, a lot of it's a sales study you know there's certain reasons that we can say things aren't bad we try to keep it fairly close because if we were to go 15 percent either way from 100 percent then the state could mandate that we do a reappraisal mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things we're trying to avoid we know that this year the numbers are going to be really skewed because of the strong yeah. the really strong market we have things, things. Sorry, we have um, properties that are going way under the assessed value because on the flip side people are making improvements and on the flip side people are not. So we have houses selling way under assessed value and way over assessed value. So, and so that CLA number then is an average? It's an it average. Is. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's a bunch of facts. Exactly. So, so just and kind a healthy of CLA after a town library appraisal actually wouldn't be 100% because that would almost be construed as like sales chasing, you know, because houses change. Even mm -hmm. the year after they're appraised, houses will change. And a healthier CLA would be at 102, 105, um, but we're at 100, and it could go under. We'll probably be at next year, yeah. probably be at 90%, you know? Um, and then who knows? And like, it's a market thing. And it's a market thing, um, especially after this year. And this 
level of appraisals also based off of a three-year equalization. If you look at our sales study. study that we get from the state every year to work on, there's a lot of properties that sell are 60, 70, 80 percent of what we have value because they're just, they're run down, they're not maintained. And other properties that have seen improvements, they're selling 125 or 140 percent. So it's kind of a, you know, it washes out. So it's just kind of, just this by luck, kind of level the, that, it's, yeah. It, yeah. That, it's this, that it's right where it's at. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And this should kind of level the. Yeah. The and at field. this point, at 2024, when we would have the town wide reappraisal, it's going to be 18 years since we have seen the houses. And there's been new houses, um, houses like that have been dilapidated, like we just visited one. Um, there's new houses on the market. There's new industrial, like we have a lot more commercial and industrial than we had in 2006 that need to be looked at because those sales are all over the place. Like um, Bell Mains recently, um, they were assessed at like 700,000 and they just sold for 169. Yeah, something like that. Um, so right there, there's an image of why. Also, if we do it this way, we're in control over the process. We get to interview firms and have a choice over them. And so like, if you're waiting for the state to do it, there's a lot of towns that had their last reappraisal, 2005, six, seven, and eight. And their CLAs are skewed too. And pretty soon all those towns are gonna to be forced by the state to have a reappraisal. And the companies right now are really full. The ones that we were looking at, they're out. Like, if we don't squeeze in, they're like, we're not going to be able to see you. Um, and so if, the ta if we wait for the state to tell us, we might be in a position where we have to take the comp Like, we don't get to choose. So we have to take whatever company will take us. Right. Um, we won't have that choice. Right now, if we're doing it, we're still 18 years out. Who knows what our CLA will be? between then, but we are in control of yeah. the company and choosing the company and being able to do interviews, being able to uh, have the company that we feel is the best and most equitable for the town instead of vice versa. Being like, who's gonna take us? Are we gonna take like, who knows, yeah. the choice. Yeah. Yeah, those, those sound like good reasons. It also seems like just basic issues of fairness, right? If we have fairness, a bunch of properties equitable. that are that are you know being assessed at way over what their current market value is because they've deteriorated over the years, that they're paying a lot more in taxes than they really want to, right? And mm -hmm. conversely, on the other side, we have properties that are paying a lot less than they really exactly. want to. It's just not fair. Exactly, and that's what we're supposed to do with the grand list. You know, we're supposed to maintain a clear grand list and we're supposed to maintain a fair market value um, and this seems like the best way to us to achieve that equity among the taxpayers. Yeah. And, and I'm sorry if I missed it, did you mention the fact that this is one of the differences between the firms is how they take you through the grievance yes. process as well and then with this one there's a software change that can occur in anticipation. It gets us out in front of the curve with some of the state mandated change or state changes that are coming with some of the software components. So we also get to kind of make that jump on our own of our own ch choosing. So this, exactly. the software was another one of the reasons we chose this firm because right now they're uh, NIMRIC, the New England Municipal Resource Center, provides software to the listers office that works with the state tax department. That's how we report is through a NIMRIC system. And the state is changing um, vendors. They're going to be getting rid of Nimric in the next couple of years. Nimric owns um, Microsoft, which is the camera program, which we use on the back end to figure out values. So there's some concern, at least from us, I think, whether Microsoft, Microsoft will be continued to be supported if Nimric loses a state mm -hmm. contract. Um, this mm -hmm. change to this firm would um, have us switch into a product called Patriot which uh, quite a few towns in the state have um, switched over to already. I know that yesterday I was doing some uh, research for real estate in Rutland and in Castleton, and both of them were using Patriot, so I had conversations with their, their staff that who really like this, this software, and um, it interfaces well with the state, so uh, that's a, one of the reasons we're considering this firm. And additionally, they will follow 
um, follow up with us through grievances all the way through the Board of Civil Authority for their price per parcel is included. For no extra cost. Some of the firms, if we ended up having grievances after this was filed um, and completed and they went to the Board of Civil Authority, we'd have to hire the firm to come in and help us with the BCA hearings. Anywhere from $750 to $1,200 a day um, prorated by the half day. So it just seemed like if we look at the total package cost, if we had grievances to the BCA level, these proposals are pretty much the same. Yeah, we're not talking about a big difference yeah. anyway. Exactly. Right? All it's three of them are within like 20000 yeah. And that yeah. was, I don't have in front of me the, the, number, the contracts are on the $200,000 right here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 208. 208. So, yeah, so we're talking about a pretty small percentage difference anyway. Yeah. yeah. The lowest bid was 205, and this is 208. No, 203. This is 208. Yeah. Yeah. Dennis, when they're doing this work, do we have, like, how do we manage it so this, you know, the last nine months of the year we've seen the real estate market just go nuts and it's starting to kind of self-correct some. It seems like it's not fair to use sales data from a fluke period to set these values. Right. How do they, how do they kind of correct that? That's a great question. And um, the firm could explain better, but I know that they plan to start, whichever firm we hire plans to start collecting data and visiting all the properties early next year. Um, I think by June of next year, the municipal consultants will be in Randolph um, visiting houses and gathering all the data. They don't make any final value determinations until just before they set the grand list. Um, and Pat probably knows this too because he's been through this before, but my understanding is they do all the data collection and they have a sense of where it's going, but they don't finalize numbers until right before the grand list is set. So that would be in like probably the winter or spring of 2024. That like, gives us three more years to get beyond this uh, bubble, if it's a bubble, or whatever we're in right now. Um, but they could probably explain that more. They're working on uh, reappraisals in several towns, four or five towns per year until then. Um, so they're dealing with this all the time, and I don't know exactly how they do it, um, but we could certainly get an answer for you. That was probably clear as mud, but. <laughs> oh, it's got to be some averages somewhere. Yeah, they, yeah. they um, if I am um, understanding this correctly, um, our sales equalization is usually based on a three-year study, a three-year average. Um, and I've not been through a town-wide reappraisal with the firm, but I know for us as in state and the CLA, um, you take it by the year and then you look at it over a three-year um, cycle. And that helps the even out the fluctuations and it finds the outliers and the... Um, Outliers and the, ex the, the extremes, extremes and the outliers. Sorry, I'm trying to put my math brain back on, mm. on my statistical brain. Um, but it's that three year average that helps. You're with talking the about sales data? It's yeah. It's giving you the values. Yes, yeah, exactly. And the commercial properties, they actually claim could be easier for them. They use a couple of different approaches for that. We use a sales, uh, a sales data as one approach. They use a cost approach and they use an income approach. So um, it's, uh, you know, commercial is a whole different kind of way of, of uh, appraising and stuff. Um, but that, and that's an important part for Ringo. Yeah. Our commercial is all over the board. Commercial and industrial. And they'll put us off on the right foot to keep it going, to be fair and equitable throughout the whole town. Because it's not just residents. It's it is commercial and yeah. industrial people as well that make up the grand list. Move more to value up towards prospect Absolutely. <laughs> Maple, right? No. Maple. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Am I correct in understanding that when you say this bid was for uh, 2024 that the project would commence with the beginning of that fiscal year? So they would start work in 2022 collecting data. They would have a they finalized grand list for us on April 1st, 
of 2024 and file with the state. So that three year time span that they would be looking at would commence now and yeah. we're back a year and a half and ahead a year and a half. Mm -hmm. okay. There's a lot to a town wide um, reappraisal. There's like the statistical part with the sales data and um, doing that part, but there's also like the physical um, going to every house and business and making sure that we have the correct data, mm -hmm. that we have the correct acreage, we have the correct land grade, we have the correct square footage, quality, um, you know, everything that's correct. So they need to also talk and visit almost every homeowner and business or have contact with. They and that takes time. Measure and sketch every single property in town um, from scratch. So they're not going to rely on any of the data that we necessarily have upstairs. They're going to do a complete brand new uh, system for us. But yeah. oh, when you say they're going to look at it, they're not doing, like, when you said acres, they're not surveying, though. Because some folks. No, look at no. This is the town records say another. Yeah, no, they look at surveys and deeds to make sure that they have the correct acreage. They're not going to do their own surveys. They're looking at what we have on our surveys and our land maps and our deeds. Right. As what is, um, yeah. I may have missed it, but what percentage of the, ha the properties do they say they would get into? Do they get um, into don't we call it a proposal? They make several attempts to get into every property. If they can't get in, they do their best estimate at what it is, and we send the property owner a notice of what we came up with for value. And if they disagree with that, then we would hope they would let us in at that point. But generally, two or three attempts at least are made to get into every single property. One of the other things we should mention that you know they really dig on PR. So this company wants to have um, meetings before they start anything, um, a public hearing, just to let people know what they're doing and answer any questions up front. They're happy to do interviews with media or use social media um, posts to keep people updated. Um, they're willing to meet with homeowners at any time before grievances even, to like a pre-grievance hearing to determine, or to discuss and explain how they do values overall. So there's a lot of outreach. You know, They just want to have really good and clear communication with property owners so that there's no surprises when the project finishes. Oh, and another thing that this company, we like about this company, is they want to be hands-on with the listers and work with the listers to make sure that when they're gone, the listers and or assessor can defend the, this grand list and keep it going. And some companies are just like, well, Sorry, we're done. See we're done, yeah. and we don't need you anyways. Like, we can do this with or without the listers, um, and companies can. But what's nice about having listers is, um, listers and an assessor, um, is that you have, like, the listers being like, oh, I don't know. I don't think I like what you're doing here. You know, like, we can say, um, I think I see a trend here that <coughs> makes us uncomfortable. Let's work on it you know, and vice versa, uh, which is really nice to have that say, because just like we have a select board meeting and we have town meetings, this is our last vestige of being community minded and community controlled, you know, like it's our last thing to like, that the state cannot take from us just yet. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I think this company recognizes that and works with that. And, and they were clear that they could do the job without our assistance, but that they would love to have a, at least a list there shadow them in every property they visit. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of times we know the, the listers know the homeowners, and mm -hmm. so it's a comfort level for them letting us into the house. But they just think it would be really a good education for us to tag along and know exactly how they're doing their job. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. We must have about this amount of money in the Fund. Yes, we're yes. very close. We started talking with Cliff a year and a half ago um, about where we need to be. We actually anticipated a little bit higher than this, um, so we we do have the funds. Yeah. Cool. All right. So we have um, any questions from anybody that's in the audience on this? Not as 
the board ready to take action? Sure. recommendation that we follow the listers recommendation and hire the company that they suggested. I second that. Do I just have a question? Another. A question about the motion if that's possible? So does that require anything of a, for us to come back at some point with a contract or does that give Trevor the power to sign a contract on the board's behalf? Good question. Black hand blue when I'm ready. <laughs> it's up to you. I think we can authorize Trevor to sign this, can't Can we? Can give us a copy of the pens when we're done? Yeah, well, we can each have a commemorative <laughs> pen when it's over here. That sounds um, good to me. Are you fine with that? Yeah, I'll second that. Okay. okay. Right. The maximum of the contract is 208. What it says. <laughs> yeah, I believe that would be it if there's anything outside the parameters we could come back to you what, but we'll know as soon as we have a co contract what, proposal from them. what is the annual support and license fee that's referenced it's for the software uh, uh, for the camera right, software yeah. which is the back end that we maintain yeah, yeah. The, that oh, i see so that's in our possession yes yeah. and we actually yeah. pay that fee right now we just pay it to a different we're company. Already paying it. yeah we're already paying yeah. it. we're already paying yeah. it. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the contract with uh, all those in favor aye, aye. Selection of a financial institution for the tax anticipation note. Got a paper copy of the memo, so I apologize. Training. We got this from Cliff at some point today. Um, Thanks, guys. I'm so just kind of hand these down, <laughs> kind of pass them down. Um, so we sent out a request, um, you know, basically an invitation for to nine different financial institutions, and then also. Um, published in a few other spots. Um, Singing tax anticipation note, this is the plan that helps us bridge July 1 through the first tax collection date in October, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. um, we got four responses. Cliff and Emory reviewed them. Uh, the recommendation is to go with Union Bank, who provided us uh, with a TAN for fiscal 21 through a combination of the fact that they've got the lowest of the interest rates at just less than 1%. And then there's a chance to um, to earn a little interest back at 1.05%. Um, and so just to give you an example, in fiscal 21, it looks like those two items are going to about net out, um, meaning that lowers sort of our borrowing costs. Uh, we may even make $1,000 back. In a best case scenario, we're not talking big money. We're talking, Cliff thought, about $3,000, and that's if we didn't draw any of the money from the TAN. Um, which could be unlikely, just depending on the timing between July 1 and mid to late October when those tax payments come in. So the recommendations to go with Union Bank, again, for those two reasons listed, um, and then we will um, go through the, uh, the documentation process there to, to set that up and get that in place. And was it to a question about whether it would be drawn down all at once or like an equity? Yeah, and usually we've drawn, I think, as needed has been. So, for example, on the one we got for 21, we got, with some of the uncertainty over COVID, we went with a, a greater amount than this. I can't remember if it was two and a half or, or, or somewhere in that neighborhood, whereas this one's for one six, I believe it was. Um, and we drew, um, I think, just less than $900,000, if I'm remembering the numbers right. Uh, I'll double check them real quick. I'm going to right here from Cliff. But. So we won't try to draw it all. It would be more of a, an as-needed. Um, but that gives us a little extra protection. Um, yeah, we drew down 835000 last fall, for example, in that first yeah. count. And do we get charged on what we don't draw? Uh, I can ask real quick, but that part. Yeah, I'm just interested yeah. in having effect. What do we do here? Now? Right. I'd like to know how banks make money if, they're, if the interest rates that they get are lower than the interest rates that they charge. We had that internal discussion, <laughs> and, and there were no answers there. Yeah, we're not quite Sounds sure. Sounds like how there's that. Some, some magic smoking going on there. <laughs> That's yeah, because they don't pay us anything. There was the a theory that paper. there, yeah, there was some sort of tax benefit to the bank, so there was sort of an additional amount <laughs> that they were able to realize. Wow, like a kickback in a car dealership. Yeah. <laughs> 
So that's like three quart Monty. Yeah, it's <laughs> really backwards. Yeah, I'm just trying to write the code real quick. I would move that we approve the tax anticipation note with Union Bank. I second that. Oh, yeah. I, I second. That was too yeah, quiet. Yeah. Didn't come through. Sorry. No, I'll, I'll speak more loudly next time, Trini. So, <laughs> sorry about That's that. Sorry. Right. Mm -hmm. um, a motion and a second on the tax anticipation note. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? Motion carries. Review of COVID-19 policies and practices. And this was more of a placeholder than anything else to see if we wanted to, to revisit. Obviously, we are trying an accommodation in-person <coughs> hybrid, and I think um, there are some technology upgrades we would benefit from if we're going to keep doing that with regards to some microphones and speakers and, and a few other things. Yeah. Um, but uh, just wanted to check in. Um, you know, We're preparing to, to continue to do these sort of hybrid uh, events. And then some of the other things were more technical, just, and we had talked a little bit, uh, I think, about it in passing with different members of them. Uh, for example, with warrants and payroll warrants, the system we've gotten in place now where we're um, sort of, there's a pre-approval, a signature, and then a, an approval when you sort of hit this moment later on. Is that a system that, that folks want to try to keep in place? It did seem more efficient. It was rooted in limiting contact points and, and visitors to the town offices, but do you want to keep those types of, of practices in place as well? But generally we're reverting back with the lifting of all the, the various restrictions and the executive orders we're, we're coming back into um, you know, our pre-COVID framework. So meetings will be, even if we do the hybrids, it'll run primarily under the underlying open meeting law, which is sort of in-person focused. And we'll just have to, depending on size of crowds and other things, um, make adjustments for that remote component. Uh, because a quorum of you are here, it's a mostly in person, it's a little bit easier to, to and it's a smallish crowd online, it's, it's a little bit easier to pull off the components. But if we had, say, a majority of you were remote, um, we'd still need a physical location, one or more of, of you and, and I. Um, here to provide that opportunity to attend, to participate, and then there are some procedural changes about um, um, calling out names at the beginning just to make sure we know who's attending. So that's if you're, you're majority remote, but still kind of we have to keep that physical piece. But I think what we'll probably end up doing is something like this, but we need to upgrade our technology so I'm not moving a tiny camera and we're trying to figure out how to how to boost insufficient sound. And, and there are some tools that are out there. Just mm -hmm. That'd be pretty easy to do. Uh, there, there's one tool out there that, that I've used in a past stop that's got the microphone automatic camera in terms of it'll learn where everybody sits and, and move to the voice. Mm -hmm. um, and has a has really good sound built into it. And we'd be able to just kind of set it in the middle and forget it. Um, and so it might be if we're going to keep these models, we'll have to think about how to make those those upgrades. So I think so that's a good idea because I think in the future, you know, some of us have traveled and been away but could attend the meeting, but we were in some other remote location. So if we were to do that, I just think that would give us all an opportunity to participate mm -hmm. as long as we were anywhere within the internet. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I, 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 was, I was reflecting on this just casually a little bit before the meeting started with a couple of people that were here, including Trevor. And um, through the writing that I'm doing about town governance in the Upper Valley and the communities I'm covering there from my, in my writing uh, endeavors, Heartland is, look, is working with their cable access provider, which is Hartford CCTV and the Hartford Technical Center. And um, they're looking at trying to integrate with the live feed. So in our case, it would be integrating with ORCA to try and find out if there's a way to integrate the live feed and Zoom into uh, an interactive live feed, essentially, is what it would be, that would be both through Orca and Zoom simultaneously, so that 
that's one of the ways there. Essentially, what I talked to the um, town administrator, um, Dave Ormiston, in Heartland uh, just a couple of days ago about this. And he said that what they're doing is looking to try and piggyback on Hartford CCTV's cameras with Zoom, essentially. That's kind of the, the, the approach they're taking. So it would be like a live, a live feed. It wouldn't be interactive. It would just be like, for, for folks on the other end of that, it would be like watching television. Yeah, yeah. But, but <coughs> anybody that's Zooming in could still participate. It would basically, and maybe we can, <laughs> our, our ORCA camera person here might be able to weigh in on this a little bit more because I don't quite understand the technology, but the I would, idea would be to integrate the Zoom feed with the cable feed, with the cable access feed, in such a way that the person watching at home could see both the Zoom participant and mm -hmm. all the rest of us who are here live. Right. Whether it would be a split screen or a cut, cut away, you had suggested, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you had suggested that maybe there'd be a, the headshot of the person on Zoom would be down in the corner of the feed or something like that. Yeah. That's what we were talking about today, but it's, um, there's been no decision made about that yet. Right. That no, is no. still, we're exploring that as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm sure everyone else is too. <laughs> and, 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 you know, there are, other, there are others in the region, uh, Bridgewater, Pomfret, uh, that I can think of who are just going to stay with the hybrid Zoom format and let it go at that. And then there are others like Reading and Plymouth who are just doing away with and going back to in person. Um, my personal point of view, both as an elected official and as a private citizen and as somebody in the media, uh, is that, in my professional capacity, is that the more accessibility we can give to people and the more creatively we can go about giving them that accessibility, both those of us who are elected officials and the general public. I mean, I think about people that are for reasons of you know, people with disabilities who are basically stuck at home. Um, they don't have a way of interacting with us in, a, in, a, uh, in an in-person, real-time environment. And I think it's important that we open up one of the, God forbid I should say, one of the silver linings of COVID is that it has made governance more accessible to a far wider range of people. So yeah. I think that's important to try and do whatever we can to continue. I completely agree. The other, the other benefit is in having the technology is outside of the select board. Um, it gives us the ability for our employees to participate in trainings without them having to travel. Um, you know, a lot of what we're seeing across government right now are remote learning opportunities that um, require the capacity uh, for the video and all that. Um, and a lot of that's all being rewritten and uh, so people can get more training and, and participate easier. So I think it's worth the investment in the, uh, in the technology. Any other topics under that? Uh, just that um, when we sort of thought about it, the, the building's open, you know, masking's highly recommended or encouraged. You know, we're following generally state guidelines for anybody who's unvaccinated. Um, we've encouraged staff that if there's an interaction um, with someone who'd prefer a mask be on, you know, folks have them mm -hmm. handy and, and are ready and willing to wear those. Um, and uh, I mean, really, it's about some of the smaller stuff. Seems like the warrant payroll warrant system's been working, so if folks want to continue with that. Um, there's some support to continue with that. Otherwise, the the reversion is just we'll bring them to you, and or we'll have to chase you down to get the three signatures for those payroll warrants that are off cycle um, from meetings. Um, in this way, let's there be some sort of review and authorization and signature in, in a way that's a little more efficient. Um, and so that's mm -hmm. you know, some of these little that. practice twists from COVID-19. Mm -hmm. We were doing that before COVID. Were you? Yeah. 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 
So just keeping that in there as well. So I'm I'm slightly confused. So be before before COVID, we would we would have three select board members come to town hall mm -hmm. to sign the warrants before they could be issued. Um, since COVID, we've been doing it with three email approvals right. and then one signature, um, and then we would sign at our you know. Mm -hmm. Actually, no, and then, and then that was it. That was all we, because we couldn't sign them because right. we didn't have the meetings. Um, and so I'm wondering, are we, are we suggesting now that we basically just keep the current it, system as, and yeah, because it seems to be working and, yeah. and there's not a compelling reason to, to go back to all or parts of the way we used to do it? Do you want to keep that twist? It seems like it satisfies some of the, the um, that certainly really satisfies the controls pieces of it because there's layers of internal review, then there's still the external review, and it's just the, the, the one authorization signature, but we've got the blessing of at least a, a majority. And so do you want to keep it that way or basically go back to the three, uh, you know, chasing three folks down for those sort of off cycle? But didn't we switch before COVID? I think we did. I understood the switch to have happened after COVID, but That's I, what I thought. That obviously it, we were having three so. people come in and sign before that. But no, I don't think so, because I was signing a lot of stuff. Three people? No, the things so that were just, just one, and then, just, and then you took some of that over. I thought we switched just prior to. Yeah, yeah. I did. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm not, not remembering it correctly. No, I but mean, in, that's what I thought. In, I thought. There was some... In any event, what we're doing now seems to work, and I'm right. happy to keep doing it and not make it any more burdensome than we already... Yeah, no, I seem to think, think it's working. If you can't do it, I come, and, you know, where there's a bell, we can usually pop in and do it. So, yeah. to me, it seems like it's working. Yeah, yeah. In right. fact, it, it'll be even better now without, since we're past COVID, because then any of us can come in and mm -hmm. sign. And yeah, exactly. for a while, it was, it was really just me yeah. um, when we were really locked down, so... Trevor, could you look at whether those can be signed electronically? Yeah, that's a great, great idea. We sign all kinds of stuff electronically. That is a great idea. Mm -hmm. documents. We ought to be able to sign yeah. warrants electronically. Mm -hmm. That is a great idea, Trini. Yeah, I'll see. And you can yeah, sign everything from that, loan documents to mortgages. Yeah. And, and if we're doing that, then I mean that's basically as easy as giving an email approval. So we could just get a majority signatures right there. Send it to you, and you just yeah click into the spot. And I like it. That would be yeah, cool. that's even more efficient. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll look into that. I think the only thing we can are like. Um, cemetery plots and some of those, but a lot of even your grant applications and grant agreements and all that can be done electronic. Absolutely. Yeah, most of the stuff we're signing for the state now for yeah the grant agreements and things like that are just the sort of the e-sign. Mm -hmm. It's pretty handy. No, well, that'd be great. It'd make you know, everything more efficient. <clears throat> These are the, the, they become manual, the smaller dollar grants that we use on primarily gravel road projects that are aimed at water quality improvement, at least in part. And they tie back to the, um, the implementation of the, of the multi, was it multi-sector general roads permit for municipalities. So think of it as a state stormwater permit for local roads. So we're able to use these grant programs to do things, um, you know, there's quite a bit of, of ditch work um, small culvert work, that type of stuff um, that ties into some of those stormwater best practices. Um, and so this was just to get us into the queue for the next round of funding. From the prior round, we are set up to um, to a project on Howard Hill that has quite a few of those elements. We'll have to um, refine that scope and come up with a plan to get that going here. Hopefully, I think August is the, is the target for that. Um, and the way that they're 80-20, so we'll be receiving $18,500 um, is sort of the 80% part, and then there's the remaining, what is it, 3700 which will have to be our match, which we can do materials in kind. So, um, you know, a lot of these projects we'll do with, with town labor, town equipment, 
and there's a, a sheet that goes to sort of account for those costs, and then we submit everything more or less at the end. Um, so all we're sort of asking, we had we had pulled folks to certify the submittal of the letter of intent and envisions the legislative body blessing that, but we did get it in before the deadline with the idea being that we would certify it tonight. Oh, I see. So we're actually certifying that it was okay that we submitted that letter of intent. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we did sort of the, the, the basic polling and then with the idea being that we'd review and certify. And if you decide not to, we can withdraw it. The money will go to other municipalities. It will be reallocated. Our decision. I'll move that we approve the fiscal year 22 letter of intent for the municipal roads grants and aid program. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Change. Motion carries. Next up is appointing an interim E911 coordinator. We're currently without any E911 coordinator, full time or interim. Um, I think once we get an executive assistant in place, and we've gone back out to advertise for that and have an interview scheduled for next week. Um, that's been one of the places that the E-901 responsibilities have been nested. Um, zoning's a common place when you look at municipalities um, throughout the state because of the tie-in with development, um, you know, development applications, subdivisions, some of these things that might generate an E-901 address or the need for one. I have been in this role before, not ideal to sort of assume another task, but until we can fill this, get somebody in, um, we need someone who can issue these addresses. We were able to work with the state, so they issued one directly for a property, um, but at some point we know we're gonna have a few others that um, it would be helpful to have someone who can at least coordinate that process on this end in the short term. So if you approve it, we'll do a little letter that um, will come from the town on town letterhead that just says head be the interim 911 coordinator. And we would do this only as long as necessary um, until we found a good, loving, permanent home. Um, uh, perhaps <laughs> other than me, but uh, okay. <coughs> but for now, this is a, 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 a way quick to fix. To, yeah, this is the quick fix, and because we know we we could have as many as three or four requests coming soon. It'd be nice to uh, be set up on the front end. Who's been doing it, Emory? Mm -hmm. Emery had done it before, but as he moved over to the court show, he, he could retain it, but his his play is, is fairly full as he's learning everything that comes with being clerk treasurer. Mm -hmm. Doing a great job with it, but this would, I think, maybe be a little much um, to add on as well. Mm -hmm. I'll move that we appoint town manager as the interim E911 coordinator. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, funding and guideline update. Yeah, I just wanted to, I think I mentioned it in a, in a distribution of materials to you, but wanted to, to note it for the record. We made the, um, the portal that was opened for municipalities to um, essentially submit for payment uh, opened earlier in June, and essentially your deadline is July 15th, so we submitted um, on the town's behalf, essentially certifying that we would uh, be participating, would like to, these ARPA funds. These are the direct aid payments to the non-entitlement units, so the money we've been talking about. It's about $480,000. It's going to be paid out in two pieces. This was the draw for the first a little less than $240,000. Next year, around the same time, we'll have to draw the second piece. Um, still no answer that I've seen on the county government funds. Um, and so we've got some time. We've got to obligate the funds by 2024 and then spend them by 2026. So it was a basic update. I went back through some of the guidelines just to make sure. One of the things that if you're agreeable to doing under this, um, I'm your authorized representative in state systems for SRF and other things, and so we were able to submit. Um, but in looking through some of the reporting for Treasury, it might be helpful just to make sure we formally bless it for the ARPA pieces on this end as well well in advance of our first reporting requirement in October. It's listed in the VLCT guidance as a should, um, having you know someone appointed specifically for this rather than a shall. And when we worked through the what do you need to submit your certification sheet, it doesn't have that element on it. 
but if it's a should, if it's going to be part of that treasury reporting, it makes some sense just to take care of it now before we even got that first payment in hand. So really it's just designating the manager as the authorized representative. Then we're set up to draw for next year as well without any questions. Um, and then um, certifying the application um, for funding that we accept. There's some paperwork I'd have to sign um, related to some of the federal requirements that are pretty standard. Um, you know, non-discrimination and um, those types of components mm -hmm. that come often with the grant funding. So it's just getting a formal blessing for what we're already set up to do. Uh, it's a should, but sometimes the shoulds are, are prudent, even if they're not shalls. So I've got a, an action sheet if you want it, but, um, but that's the, the quick version. I would, I would move that we appoint the town manager as our designated uh, representative to represent the town with regard to all our funding. And certify our application in so adherence correct. to all oh. applicable and rules. And certify our Th that'll, application. That'll cover us, yeah. 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 That would be great. Absolutely. A second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Trevor, uh, it would be helpful if we understood kind of the bigger picture with this. I know we have to come up with kind of a plan of what to do with this money and and, not, um, and not only from the perspective of what it can be used for, but how it might be able to complement um, applications for some of the infrastructure funding that's coming at the federal level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I I think we're at a good spot where we should have a, have a sort of a lengthier community conversation about what the funds can be used for, how we want to try to use them, and to set some prioritizations in place um, with an eye toward, um, we'll have the first half, obviously, but we'll be fully funded next year at this time. So we've got a little bit of time to, to have the conversation if we're viewing it as a full funding kind of scenario. But I, I, I agree, we're at that spot where we should start to talk about what are eligible uses? What are the things we think we can use under those categories? Mm -hmm. How do we engage the community? How do we start to prioritize? Because 480 could go, sounds huge, but it could go fairly quickly depending on, on where it goes. Do you know, I, I haven't seen anything in the, in the um, legal cities and towns documents that I've looked at that, that addresses this. Do you know if there's a system in place for vetting expenditures before the fact so that you don't get left holding the bag if it falls outside the parameters of the approved funding? There's a couple of different contacts, I think, both um, one through the state that, I, that it seems like is more directly connected to Treasury, and I think that would be the sort of the chain to say, hey, we got an idea, and we'll run it up to the Treasury level, because what's going to guide, or at least what's guiding right now how we can or can't spend the funds is that interim rule that went in in late May. And we're taking comments on through July 16th. So it's possible that that could change as well, but that's the one that set those sort of broad categories um, up for, you know, it's support public health expenditure, um, replace lost public sector revenue, um, water, sewer, broadband infrastructure, some of those, you know, category buckets that are out there, mm -hmm. as opposed to at one point it had been talked about, thought that it might be a more flexible pool of money that municipalities could use in whatever they way they thought sort of appropriate. Um, in response either to COVID-19 or just to meet community needs. But it, it seems like it's going to be constrained to to those buckets as sort of the overarching, but then it might be within that, hey, we've got this idea, we think it qualifies under one or more of these categories. Is this an appropriate use? And, and what would we need to show, if anything, um, for that? Um, but I think we need to look at what the capital committee is working on like what are our priorities and our projects out there because you know you you could use that money to offset an expense that we already have in our budget also to free up money that could be used kind of to match a grant if there uh, if there's you know water and sewer projects out there if there's highway projects, all those are things that we should be getting our our heads around what they are and how much we're looking for. Because it, 
all this, you know, we just had uh, a call for earmarks, for example, um, with the congressional folks. They, we're not in a very good position to be taking advantage of some of this money that's out there or that's coming. And it would be good for the whole, not just this 400000 but there's, you know, bigger pots of money, too. We're just not ready. And some of it might be digging into the, there's a sort of a fact sheet on the categories, but there's a the 39 page treasury guidance that goes with it. Uh, when you look through that really quickly, there might be some ways to try to link together an infrastructure project that has multiple elements that might be. So that if you've got a water line and you can tie also in some stormwater infrastructure, for example, that's referenced in those bigger guidelines. Yeah. Because you're in there, you're doing that project, those elements meet. Some of the requirements can you also cover the cost to repave say because you've cut everything open and do some of the repair so is a way to sort of extend that capability into a broader project or does it just cover the elements you might have to do the water stormwater pieces and then it lowers the overall project cost for us um, so it's still advantageous but it might just be figuring out you know going into that larger guidance and trying to pull out here are the pieces and can we stitch them together and what would that look like and then running them up through that to say, does this fit? Um, like Maple Street or something. <laughs> it, it's got a few of the elements and, you know, and if you could find a way to add a broadband element to it too, you know, you're really hitting all the infrastructure buckets. But um, yeah, and some of it might be just finding ways to, you know, some of the allowed uses are more programmatic and, and might require a little more in terms of um, you know, the community support focused um, could do there are certain elements in there for land loan or grant programs if that was we got to a spot where we couldn't find other eligible uses we might be able to create something that is of impact locally but functions a little differently than, than what we're used to doing it's almost like a miniature revolving loan fund for businesses impacted by COVID or um, you know, otherwise meeting criteria so it's it's there are some of those other potential uses out there too, but we have to really I think, figure out what those categories mean for us and how we can best take advantage. Um, but we've got some time, I think it's a good run up to start doing it now, running it kind of um, parallel to capital budgeting conversations that are ongoing into budgeting conversations with an eye toward um, you know, putting ourselves in a spot, say July 1 of next year, where maybe we've got an implementable plan um, to send those dollars back out the door in some way. I think that's a reasonable timeline, especially when you think of when we can draw the 480. So it's also using that split payment to our advantage to make sure we're ready to hit it um, when we draw it in the next May. Hopefully it's a little earlier in the, in the year for the portal and say we draw it in May and we're ready. Funds in hand on July 1 to do something or a bunch of some things. But so I think we're well set up, but we do have to have that figure out what we can do, how we can do it, prioritize it, engage, and then come up with a plan. And, and then the implementation might be the easier part in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. These are good problems to have, which is nice. It's not going to be hard to spend it, though. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, shucks. Yeah, how can you put $500,000 to good community use? Yeah, if we put our heads together, we can figure it out. Yeah. All right. Next up, we have assembly permits. You've got a pair in there. One's for the Matsuri Music Festival. This is a fundraiser for a program run through the high school um, through the, for the, the Japan program for students in 21 and 22, so a music festival um, out at Fars Hill. And then the second one is the RACDC request for a um, cornhole tournament community fair at Salisbury Square. Both are in June, or I mean August, I'm sorry. The first one's 821. Um, they've got a rain date listed to, I think, of 822. And then um, the primary date on the other one is 828. <coughs> Bless you. Well, as the property owner, I'm going to abstain from the fire sale conversation. So, do you want to take them in two pieces for that? So, maybe do the. Yeah. yeah. It's not really a conflict. Well, 
I recommended that they get the permit even though they didn't think they might get the 500 number, but I just suggested they get it in case they did. So. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. They're, they're not anticipating hitting, hitting the 500. They thought they'd be three to four, but yeah. they've got some interesting performers, so they could end up with mm -hmm. a bigger crowd. So. So taking them separately, any questions, comments, or motions on the music festival? I move that we approve the permit for the music festival. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And the Cornpole Tournament? I'll move that we approve the permit for the Cornell Tournament. Second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Now we have a grant for the library. Yep, so yeah, uh, Amy wrote to me while she was still on the call with the Department of Libraries. There's a non-competitive, non-matching grant they're after for about $8,700. Looking to use it in some of the categories outdoor furnishings, technology, collection purchases, or some of the things listed. And then uh, this all happened after we posted, and the, the deadline is August 6th, so even before we meet again. You're looking for a motion to authorize the application? Yep. I'll move that we authorize the application for the library grant. Second. The, the land use regulations, which Trina's saying we'll do under old business, which is next. Oh, okay. And then there was the library right. grant that you just right. did. Those, yeah. So those were the two, right. two okay. additions. I, I didn't realize that we were putting that under yep. old business. It's already been a topic on the agenda. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have had it a couple times now, so. Yeah. So we have a request. <laughs> Mary Ann to go on the energy committee. Yep, I still have, have room. I believe she's even been attending. I don't know. I don't know, Mary. I don't know if she's here or not. Or she's not here, but I didn't hear. Yep, communicated with her. So. I'll move that we appoint Mary Ann Zavez to the energy committee. Second that. Should, I think she'll be a good addition. Second? Second. Aye. 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 motion carries. Next up is the land use regulations. For to adopt the amendments. I'll move that we adopt the amendments to the land use regulations. And I will second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 These will, oops, sorry, these will now be effective 21 days from now, barring an appeal filed, I believe it's by the 20th day. Right. 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 Okay. Thank you, Jenny and uh, students. Is mm -hmm. that oh, students? Yeah, great. So is there, uh, next up is other business? Uh, the primary update is probably on Beanville, on the culvert projects. Um, while excavating down to the depth for the new culvert, they encountered, I don't think I've referred to it before, as soup, which um, has been an interesting challenge. So there's been a lot of both groundwater, there's been some storm water. Um, it's not the, the brook itself that's getting in, but it's creating a... Um, 
a situation where it's difficult to dewater the area, so it's difficult to get it stable, which means it's difficult to then start to install the culvert, which the pieces are being delivered um, either today or tomorrow. And so we've been working with the engineers, with the state, and then geotech engineers. This is a soil type that showed up in the borings um, as having an infinite depth, at least in terms of those borings, where it went down below. But I don't think anybody anticipated how wet it has been as they've gotten down, particularly on the on the outfall end. Um, so we've been trying to work through different options with that to both dry the area out and to make sure that the silt that's coming out and, and mixing its water isn't making its way back in, into the brook on the outlet side. So there's been a bit of a battle. The rain certainly hasn't helped, um, at least in that case. Um, we could dome that area off, that would help. Um, but we've come up with some solutions, I think, um, that will allow the culvert to go in. It'll move a little bit closer to the new culverts and um, where they were going to put sort of a footwall on the outfall to prevent water from kind of coming out of the culvert, going back and washing out under. Mm -hmm. We'll do a different combination of, of some smaller concrete elements there and then and some stone. So we may end up with a maintenance practice where every so often we'll have to check, um, make sure that stone is still in the place it should be, and if not, um, at an appropriate level to prevent that kind of um, erosion underneath that, that outlet end. Um, the inlet end seems to be much drier, a little bit easier to work with. Um, there haven't been as many issues with that. Um, is it all going to result in some additional materials? And we're talking about what that should look like as a change order. Um, and even as originally presented, we'll still be under our overall project budget. However, we'll be starting to come up really close to hitting our heads on the ceiling of that if we were to just go forward. But some of that potential change order is um, um, looking at some of the, when the road runoff comes off in the middle of that dip and has eaten away at that bank, is there a way we can sort of stabilize that with stone? That's a big chunk of that change order, but is that something that we could plan and do? Maybe look at sort of local resources to say, um, we find a different way to, to cover that cost um, and to keep it out of the project budget just in case there's something else that gives us an extra $20,000 of room, for example. Um, but if not, you'd probably use the funds that way. It, yeah, and so if we don't need it, we can maybe at the end kind of do, see, do that piece. Yep, do a back end. So that's the less critical piece. Um, okay. So we're going to probably do some element of it. What's challenging is um, you know trying to figure out what's the right number of cubic yards for some of the stone and the other elements when you don't know how much it's going to take to stabilize it and, and what we are doing. And part of why we're looking to shift it and stabilize where we are rather than keep excavating is there's concern about the slope that's um, on the New England precision side of the culvert because mm -hmm. uh, there's got that layer, same sort of layer of gravel, silt, and lots of water coming out of the bank in, in different spots. And so you don't want to destabilize that too, so we'll have to make sure that we're stabilizing that. None of this seems to impact the project schedule at this point. It's just a, a budget impact. And so that's been what a good chunk of the last week has been about. And the state signed off on moving the culvert, so we're OK there. Um, and so that'll shift it, shift it a little bit toward the existing culvert, uh, maybe change some of the, the So that's moving it down, down the road, away from New England Precision? Yeah, so the culvert was kind of beyond a, kind of an alignment you know, just off this way, and it'll sort of shift yeah. to snug up to the to the existing culvert a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. It works out to be between two and either two feet or five feet, so somewhere in that range, I think it moves. Not a significant change. No, no, that's what the the um, DEC board said was it's it's still within the intent and scope, and that's what they blessed it today. So hopefully that'll keep moving. If they can stabilize that, they're ready to start adding the culvert pieces, and it's becomes a matter of of backfill. And, Sort of set up that way. Kind of interesting, such a dry spring. Yeah. Wouldn't have thought you would have ended up with that kind of problem Yeah. at yeah. this point. And it was the kind of material that even where it looked dry, if you just sort of tapped your foot on a little bit, that it would bring up just enough water that it would jelly. Mm. Uh, and it's just, yeah, real fine gray silt, and mm -hmm. you mix it with water in there. Normally you can pull a certain amount of it out, you know, as you pull water out. It, it just None of the traditional things have really seemed to, to work or work well. Some of them have worked a little bit. Uh, and even the geotech guy who said he had 40 years in was just like, I don't, I don't know, I haven't seen this one. I never saw this before. Yeah, huh? yeah, that, that's yeah. reassuring. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, 
Same so, thing with geoengineers and tell you where to locate a well. Say, wow, man, no, it, we would have sworn there was water there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so we're, we'll have to work through that. But you go back to the dozens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So we split the change order into pieces. So what do you need to do to keep the culvert piece moving? And we'll have to talk about how to do the materials. It's really just making sure we're getting the right amount, that there's the right amount of check on that because there's nobody on site to measure some of those truckloads. So if we leave it open-ended, even as good as that relationship's been with the contractor, it's just, you need to check a balance. Yeah, it's just not a comfortable spot to, yeah. to be in. And so trying to figure out the right way to, to handle that piece. And then that stone piece at the top is at the very end. You can wait, but <coughs> so it's moving forward. We're wrestling with it a little bit, but you know, still basically still on track to finish on that one we thought though. Yeah, there hasn't been any talk about a scheduled disruption. <coughs> Which is good. I, I was there the other day. It's quite a hole. It's yeah. really pretty. It's a big Yeah, yeah. No <laughs> doubt my mind. Yeah. And we were talking about parade stuff, and there was well, is there any way you can use any of it? And so I had a picture from when I'd been in the bottom of the hole before that meeting. I said, well, this this is where I was st standing 30 minutes ago. This is at the bottom, and at that point, it's like they've got another six to eight feet to go. So they're hauling that material out of there, or are they saving to put back? Some of it they're saving to, to put back and trying to, to stash at different places. Um, and they wanna, they're want they trying to find a spot to, to stash the culverts, too, until they can drop them in. And so has anybody talked to the new landowner just down the road there who purchased Michael Hale? Um, he, he just yeah. just beyond, the, just I'll, before the storages? Yeah. I what, can, what part the Tuckers used to own? Yeah, I can see if they've talked. I, mean, I, I, worked I, with I have them. a really good relationship with them. I don't think it'd be a problem if they wanted to set them there. And I can't believe you'd be opposed to that. Yeah, they were hoping originally to use the, the branchwood parcel, but because the, the site assessment's underway, we can mm -hmm. only do snow removal there. Mm -hmm. So it's been nice. I mean, this is just, yeah. you know, it's like a quarter of a mile away. Yeah. I mean, if you decide, if you think that's an option you want to go, I could reach out to them for it. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask Desi and Rick rather than because they asked me again. You know what I'm referring to, right? Just roughly, just I, beyond, just around the corner, beyond the apartment house. There's a nine-acre lot there that they just put a new road in. Yeah, right there. Okay. I don't think you'd be opposed to that. Whose parcel is that? It used to it was Joe Showbex, and then it transferred to the Tuckers, from the quarry, and they just recently sold it to Michael Hale, who's the owner of. And talk at post cap. So he's hoping to have a place the future expand to. <laughs> we'll see. Needs water and sewer. <laughs> so, but there's yeah. It seems like they could land them right on that road. Yeah, that might work well for them. Too. I think I saw one of them the other day parked up by the wheels tails. Right, that was a piece of it. Yeah, uh, could have been. Yeah, yeah there's going to be concrete, either. probably twelve by, pretty good size. Yeah. There's Somewhere between 11 and 13 segments, I think. Yeah. 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 So it will be quite a few of them. Well, take a look at it, let me know. I'll yeah. okay. can reach out to them. I'll pose it to the, to the crew there. There's also some um, land down there that somebody owns the uh, storage business on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had heard that, yeah. <laughs> You're storing culverts now. <laughs> you give the town a good rate for that, right? It's uh, probably better than what's in some of those units. <laughs> <laughs> they can give you all the all the fine silt you could possibly want. Well, I might be interested in some of that. <laughs> Put it in the traps at Montague. <laughs> I mean, it's it's really it's. Incredible how just how fine this stuff is. Yeah. Well, if they are looking for a place for something, they might have a home for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's the big one. We we were close to full strength Tuesday for the first time in about three to five weeks, um, which was nice in terms of people back from different leaves, um, vacation schedules, all of that. Um, there was one point last week where we had three of us, I think, in the building. And it, it was a little sparse um, mm -hmm. to cover, so it's nice. It was nice. It, it's been much more relaxed this week with a full array of bodies, but we've had some cliffs back in. Cliffs back, but then mm -hmm. vacations are 
yeah. winding down, or you couldn't with the camera. You couldn't see Josh. Yeah, had a kind of a freak accident and, and broke part of his leg. I mean, just stuff like that too. Yeah. That what happened, Josh? He he <coughs> um, fell down basically in a, in a funny way and, and broke. Fractured his femur. Yeah. Uh, oh. No, it was either the, it was the tibia or the fibula. One of the oh, fibula, fibula. Whichever smaller one that isn't necessarily weight bearing. Right. This is how good my anatomy now. Yeah, I don't know either. Fibula. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Boy. So he's been on. So we've got kind of a crutch cane cast. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, poor Josh. The way out of the hall. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. We have wow. We have backs and legs here. Yeah. yeah. But uh, so that that's been good. That's that's helped level us. Somebody to use the elevator. That's good. That he, yeah, he was using it for a bit, and then just has decamped to the, the zoning office. Camps to the zoning office. Yeah, that's yeah. made life quite a bit easier. Okay. Um, yeah. Trevor, the other day I ran into you and Morgan. Uh, Morgan yep. was describing some of his challenges over the summer with with finding people to do stuff. I was wondering if maybe you can sort of fill in other folks who might not know, because I didn't know before what kind of challenges he's been having. It, it, yeah, it's another area where we've got folks um, going out for longer terms for, for various leaves. We're going to have one employee who's going to be out for at least six weeks um, from one of the, the highway crew slots. Um, in addition to, um, uh, with the combination slots, those two employees, we've, we've got a good lead on a second one to fill that slot, but if we're able to fill those, those are with Harold right now. Um, where Morgan might have some use for him. So it might be that if we do fill that second slot, we're trying to figure out if Harold's in a good spot and we can slide them over to highway a little bit to help while they're short staff. And then they've had different people out, coming, going. Um, and so some of Morgan's concern that, that's been ongoing is about um, there's making sure he's got enough bodies to do the, the different things they've got scheduled, particularly you know some of the ditching, culvert work, some of those pieces. Um, and so it's it's been complicated by the absences that are, that are totally necessary in a lot of these cases. And, and as we try to um, work the hybrid positions in, you know, are they available, and if so, how? Um, and not having you know, those bodies that may have been in, in, in the road department before, you know, can we figure out how to share them, especially as grass growing slows down, knock on wood, the pools holding together, you know, some of these other things that were way more emergent. The pace of, of burials has dropped off significantly. I mean, that was from mid-May to mm. mid to late June. That was that Pretty was busy. the storm. Yeah. And so the thought of sending somebody, even if you had them, to help was hard. But we might be in a spot now where we can slide those over. But it'll be worth sort of seeing how this system works, um, and if we need to think about rededicating or, or moving folks sort of long term into one role or another or whatever it is. But there's, as people are learning it, there's been some push pull um, exacerbated by, by the absences. Yeah, having somebody go for six weeks. Um, plus the, you know, those two new guys, I think there's the added pressure of if we fill the second slide, we've got two new guys, we've got to make sure that they both um, have their CDL licenses in place, that it's well before the snow flies, that we've got time to train them on routes. And so I think some of that's the pressure that Morgan and I talk that he feels as well, to make sure that, that they're set up for when that comes. So with, with the potential of what you have right now, do you think that you have that covered? I think you need another. I think we're close. I wonder, I wonder um, and we'll have to see how long some of the absences are. It might be, there might be some merit to seeing if there's someone we can, some way we can move some of the pieces, get some resources into highway, maybe backfill somewhere else, um, and into patches too for now. But it'll be interesting. We'll just have to see sort of how long people are out and what we can mm -hmm. accomplish. Yeah. And, and we may have, we've thought you know, about our own manpower, but there might be certain things that we're able to hire out at a comparable cost and done its manpower equipment insurance. It's just one sort of, you're there for that period of time to do that thing. Um, so sort of looking at like a contract services arrangement for if you've got a you know, handful of smaller culvert projects, for example. Um, right. Something that this year we have to see if we can find somebody to do that um, and set up and just do it all as opposed to trying to move people around to do it. So it'll well, be a little not bit... worry about your skill level so much if you're farming some of that out. So you don't necessarily need yeah. you know, an excavator operator 
that that's what you're lacking to, to do those kind of things. So yeah, it might be beneficial to take some of those and farm them off. Yeah. So it might be that's how we, in other places I've been, that's how we've, when we've had sort of that more acute staffing need, we were able to kind of meet it that way. You know, think project specific, what can you offload? And then you can kind of retrench to core core tasks. Mm -hmm. And so that's some of the exercise we have to we have to work through that we haven't yet. Um, so there's been a discussion about sand. Uh, only a little bit, only for me to relay that I heard quite a bit about it when you were um, okay. interviewing me and that it would be nice not to hear. I mean, well, it's an entertaining it story, it'd be nice not to hear about okay. it. Okay, I'm just hoping that gets addressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, one of the things where if we could find the capacity with, um, you know, building a new screen, they think they can fabricate a new screen, especially for the village, and it's more mobile, they can set up a little differently. It'll make that process a little more efficient, but it's being able to dedicate the, the fabricators for that period of time. And so maybe if we're able to shift some stuff around, we can do that. Okay. But, yeah. Just checking in on now, that one. It would, before it yeah. ever gets here. Yeah, it would be really nice not to have to. We should be buying sand that meets our spec. Yes. We don't have to then resift it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There are some process elements we could tighten up, I think, to, to avoid. I'm fine. You know, you need the screen to be able to take out the frozen stuff, but, you know. Like C. Trina said, sand that meets the specs is what we really should be buying and not yeah. stuff that's causing problems. So uh, I just want to bring it up now because it's July and next yeah. thing you know it'll be November. So yeah, I've still got stones in my garage that I'll bring down <laughs> for you if need be. You should just throw those in the, in the ruts here in the spring is what you should have done with those, okay? Yeah, true. <laughs> I think one of those hit my windshield. Yeah. Okay. Glad we're to know you're on that one. <laughs> he was listening when we were interviewing. Yeah, he was. Go <laughs> yeah. oh, ahead. Yeah. Perfect. Is it down right? to the smallest screen. So. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It's all about the products, right? Trevor, did you have more in the manager's report? I, don't, I think those are the highlights. We hit some of the other pieces that we've been working on along the way. Um, touched on some of the staffing stuff, Beanville. Um, we went back out again with the paving bids after not receiving any responses, and this time did more directs. So to direct to five different um, entities, and then had a sixth inquirer who was looking at maybe some other work in town on the water wastewater end. Um, those are due next week, so hopefully that'll bear some fruit. That's um, we've gotten quite a few calls the last week about um, fish hill in particular. Uh, so I'm just trying to talk through that. That we are trying to uh, address that piece with these, um, <coughs> this paving bid, and then um, you know, they've been working through some issues with the um, some of the well pumps, particularly at Pearl Street. But we've got some plans that are developing, so. I'm guessing by that August meeting we'll have something to, to put before you um, that will focus on some of the necessary repairs. Aging equipment that has failed is sort of the short version mm -hmm. of it. Um, and we're talking preliminary price and we're seeking multiple. We could be talking to repair in the 20 to 30,000 dollar neighborhood for different pieces of equipment. It hasn't impacted water supply or anything. Uh, been a bit of a management challenge just trying to figure out what it is, diagnose it, and then come up with a, 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 a fix so that we can avoid that. Um, well, keeping an eye on the fact that we'll, we'll largely be decommissioning, not decommissioning as well, but we'll be sliding into an ancillary protective right. capacity right. within 18 months as well. So just trying to balance all of those different pieces out. Is it the main pump? I think it, it might be at Pearl Street, yeah. Try to pull up what Chris sent me. And Cliff did say that we we do get charged interest on the TAN for the dollars we don't use, but it's offset by the earning interest on the funds not used. And since we earn at a higher rate than we pay, 
Crazy. It essentially becomes, yeah, it washes it's itself like out. Yeah. Yeah, credit line dealing with I'd love to have that as a credit line. Oh, like, boy. Well. That's I'd love to have that as a mortgage. Yeah, that's that's that. That would be great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to earn interest. And then just before you all go, I have some things that have, um, that just need signatures that have been held through, either through COVID or like tonight's liquor licenses while you're here. And then call you back in. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. We're always, we're used to doing that. We just haven't yeah. done it for 15 months. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so pass the file. Yeah. Are we going to clarify that we're going to stick with the signatory policy we've had? It sounds like we can, we can do that. Yeah. yeah, if there's stuff that you need signed while we're here, go sign them. Yeah, I've got a few. Yeah. So, so it sounds like with that tan, we want we actually want it to be as big as possible. Right? We want to borrow like billions of dollars. Wow! Tack that up another million. Yeah, right. We do have statutory limits. I oh. don't remember. It <laughs> might be you can we can borrow up to ninety percent of what our anticipated levy is. Oh, let's go for it. Was it revenue so we could we could, we could <laughs> go up, but we can't. Uh, well, it up to what? To well, it seems like we're going to make money on this, right? Yeah. If we don't, uh, it all depends. If we Depends on how much we draw off of it. We right. Might, uh, we might make another thousand bucks. But the more the more we the more we we have in reserve, the more interest we'll get on that, and which is more than the interest that we're paying, and so we should max it out, right? <laughs> like, like what's yeah. what's the downside to maxing it out? It seems like we're just it's just a, an opportunity to make a little more money. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, I mean the downside is that we wouldn't we wouldn't need we'd be essentially well we might make some money we'd be um, seeking some short term debt service cuts that we just don't need based on cash flow projections and some of these other things. Right, we don't need it, but so it could be even that the banks say, well, you don't look like you need it. You yeah. look like you need this amount because yeah. we'll we the said is the cash. Might so they might they might not give it to us, but we could ask. <laughs> yeah, it's free money, free money it's right? Free yeah. it's free I mean. Yeah. It's free I, I, money. No, there's no free money. I know it seems it like it is. This sounds yeah. like I know it. I know it's this, just, this, just ridiculous. This is me. no. This really is. I mean, I, it's bizarre that it's this way, but it does sound like this is real free money. It's it is an odd system, yeah. But, so we, we should make we should take money. advantage of it as much <laughs> as much as we can. Yeah, yeah. It, and it, like, it might be what oh. the return yeah, would be I mean, if everything continues where it is. One twenty one. Maybe $1,000 to so the big, So the big thing here really is we're not talking a lot of money. No, we're talking no. about if we max it out, we might get like another couple hundred dollars or something. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, and so, like, yeah. not, mm. don't spend a lot of time worrying about this. No. Yeah, so okay. we did, we did, we're doing Fair one enough. six, we did two eight, I think it was two five or two eight, you know, four 21, and we're going to net out with the, the $1,000. And that was a more conservative projection, a higher amount based on cash flow and certain type of COVID. In the best case scenario, three thousand dollars. I think is what put the same groups are right now. Because they're also pretty close in terms of those percentage rates. Yeah, you know, point one percent or whatever. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. I wish. If uh, what if the credit card was, was paying me money every month yeah. Yeah, where instead where of me it. paying that? You need a motion to adjourn? Are you done? Yeah. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.